So we've all heard of the, the movie and the saying of paying it forward. And um, a few years ago, I came up with the term paving it forward when um, there are times when I'm sometimes faced with a situation where I decide, well, what difference is it going to make if I, if I stand up for myself or if I speak my mind on this? Then I think, well, maybe the person who comes after me will be affected by the fact that I spoke up, and so I call that paving it forward. And when we write our personal histories and share our life stories, we are in essence paving it forward, just like the pioneer journals have paved it forward and fed our faith, and we stop to um, we forget to remember that the stories we tell today could be the pioneer journals of tomorrow. So, I got this from a book called The Secrets of Happy Families, Improve Your Mornings, Rethink Family Dinner, Fight Smarter, Go Out and Play, and much more by Bruce Feiler, who is quoting Marshall Duke, who was an Emory University psychology professor. So that's rather a long citation there, but he says, children who have the most balance and self-confidence in their lives do so because of what he calls a strong intergenerational self. They know they belong to something bigger than themselves. And ever since I read that, I've thought about my little grandchildren and how, while I enjoy writing my novels and my stories, that I want to make sure that I leave the story of my life behind because I don't know in what ways those kids and my children and stepchildren um, are going to struggle and in what ways one of my stories might be inspirational to one of them. He also talked about three different kinds of narrative, family narratives. There was the ascending family narrative. Son, when we came to this country, we had nothing. Our family worked, we opened a store, your grandfather went to high school, your father went to college, and now you. So that rags to riches story or the overcoming the odds story, and then there is the descending family narrative, which I said, okay, I don't know how helpful this is to say, well, we were once on top of our game and then all this bad stuff happened and oh no, look where we are now. Sweetheart, we used to have it all and then we lost everything. And uh, living in hurricane country, I thought that the uh, three different storms converging there kind of looked like sometimes how we feel life is shaping up. And then the third one is the oscillating family narrative, the most helpful one. It's, dear, let me tell you, we've had ups and downs in our family. We built a family business. Your grandfather was a pillar of the community. Your mother was on the board of the hospital. But we also had setbacks. You had an uncle who was once arrested. We had a house burned down. Your father lost a job. But no matter what happened, we always stuck together as a family. The bottom line, if you want a happier family, create, refine, and retell the story of your family's positive moments and your ability to bounce back from the difficult ones. That act alone may increase the odds that your family will thrive for many generations to come. Well, I have a little confession to make. I have always found genealogy work to be really, really excruciatingly boring. And I've always felt guilty that I wasn't doing any of it and that I was not searching through the archives for generations dead people. And um, I once had a neighbor who was once heavily into genealogy and I um, 
actually decided that was because she got along better with dead people than with live ones. <laughs> and I've always kind of liked being engaged with the, the live variety. And one day it re I realized that in, in writing about my life and in sharing stories from my history that I am, that it, that is a form of family history work also. And uh, so I, by writing these stories, I've banished some of the guilt of leaving the genealogy research to great Aunt Ethel and the people who are a little bit better at that end of it. Some of the unintended benefits of writing your own story, it can be therapeutic to write about your life. You will begin to see how things you do will become part of the whole. Writing about your past can actually shape your future and impact your current choices. Your strengths and weaknesses will become clearer as you write about your life experiences. I'm all the way up to the sixth grade and I'm like, okay, I still have all the same faults. I'm still doing all the same things that I did in elementary school. That, um, yeah, it's interesting to see those patterns emerge. <laughs> and remember that your history could be to your ancestors what the pioneer journals have been to theirs. <coughs> Families are a gold mine of experiences. I actually have a video of us attempting to take this picture where the one little guy had to be held up because he kept trying to escape. And in the video, he's doing cartoon air legs, trying to run away even though Uncle Sean's got him off the ground. And um, Ellie there in front holding her baby sister and her clothes are coming further and further up and she's becoming less and less um, restrained until she finally falls on the floor and at least one of the babies is crying and little Lucy, the dark haired one in the corner is the oldest grandchild who has got the, the I call it the Becky face the uh, do I have to put up with this much longer that I always would see on my stepdaughter Becky's face in uh, pictures with her and her four brothers. But uh, that's one of my favorite family pictures because we've never had any success at taking family pictures. And every time I try to get everybody together for a family photo, it usually ends in some kind of a, a family fight or an unpleasant, it's like we don't have those Norman Rockwell pictures in our house because when you see them, you're reminded of the time that I told Robbie, okay, you can sit here, you played video games until two o'clock last night, so you can sit here for another 10 minutes. So he started the timer on his phone and while I was trying to corral all the grandchildren and everybody, the timer on his phone went off. And he said, he dared to say, Susan, time's up. And he put the last stamp in the book and he redeemed the prize. So think of writing your history as a way of showing love to those who will come after. and believe in the power of your story. Sometimes we think, okay, so you go to Barnes and Noble and you see the biography section and you go, okay, well, I'm, I'm not John Wayne and I'm not this famous politician or statesman or entertainer or I'm just me, I'm just, this average person from La Ie and I went to Kahuku High School and what is there to write about me and and uh, but if you start writing you'll be surprised at what kinds of things you remember and um, what kind of content you find in your own boring life. In fact a couple of the quotes that I've used in here are from a book called You Are Boring, 
but you are uniquely boring. So we are all boring in our own way, and we may not be boring to our children and our grandchildren. Imagine for a minute that you had the key to the mint or a map to a buried treasure. Wouldn't you want to give that information to someone before you died? Picture your unique stories as something of value to be passed on to future generations. What you esteem as of little value might prove priceless to someone else. And add details, technology, the car you drove, the kind of phone you talked on, all of that, while seemingly uninteresting to you now, will be vastly different in the future. Just like in Back to the Future, when they're like, the kids going, what kind of a lame video game is that? You have to use your hands. And uh, so it might not seem interesting to someone the story of, of me on the telephone with the cord stretched as far as it can go out onto the back porch so that I can talk to that boy in private because the only phone we had was stuck to the wall and if a guy calls to ask me for a date, you can bet one of my brothers will announce that, Susan, it's a boy, and then the whole family will be standing around to listen to your conversation. You don't know how grateful you should be for having the privacy of a phone that you can zip into your Superman um, booth and, and have some privacy. We also um, had a party line, which is something that many of you probably may not even be aware of existed, which is that to save money on our phone bill, we could share our phone line with another family. So sometimes you needed to call one of your friends and you'd pick up the phone and you would hear somebody else talking on the phone. And that was your party line, people. And so the polite thing to do was to hang up, of course, unless it was an interesting conversation in which um, you were able to eavesdrop if you could keep from breathing loudly into the phone. And, and uh, some people did that, too. And something my brothers found out that they could do was if you dialed a certain number and hung up the phone, it would ring at the party line and it would ring at our house. And so you would both pick up the phone thinking the other one had called and have a very confusing conversation. And when I found out that a cute boy at high school uh, was our party line person, my brothers loved to, no, I didn't call you, you called me, no. And uh, call in, and so I could have awkward conversations with this party line guy. Start by overcoming your excuses. My life is boring. I don't have time. I don't know how. I wouldn't know where to start. I haven't lived long enough yet. Well, that last one might be true. Yeah, it, it's true, you know. And, and so my best suggestion is wait until you've got Alzheimer's and you're 95 in a nursing home. And then you can make your life way more interesting than it was. And it totally takes care of the my life is boring part. <coughs> because you can, you know, write about it however you wish it had happened. But um, I've, I've been breaking my life down into four different parts of 20 years each. And I said, hey, I've got birth to age 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and I'm 61 now. So I said, that's where I should start. I should start on that last part, and I should write about the last year, because then I could be done with that part until I have some more things to write. But, uh, but I decided instead to be chronological and, and uh, try and start at the beginning. So you need to learn to kick your critic to the curb. And somebody had posted this um, illustration of the writing process. And I think that it, it's a, a pretty good example for any of us. First you're like, 
okay, I am going to write this brilliant, best-selling novel, and then you write a few pages and you read them and you're like, what made me think I could write? And uh, so, anyway, the, the intersection between the narcissism and the self-doubt, yeah, just sit down and write. And the beauty of this kind of writing is that it doesn't have to be New York Times bestseller worthy. It just needs to be your story. So create a skeleton. Get the basic facts and timeline down and then begin to fill in the stories. List the things you remember or want to write about under each category. Come up with different headings and then work on a chronology, blending the different aspects of your life. So recently, my husband and I were traveling in Oregon and Washington, and while we drove from Corvallis, Oregon to Seattle, I interviewed him, and I got his work history and all kinds of interesting things um, on a car ride where he was a captive audience, couldn't get away, and so after I got his work history down, then I started uh, another section and asked him about all of his church callings that he's had. And that's a helpful way to create the skeleton because you start to make a, a timeline of, okay, this is when I lived here, and then this is when we moved here, and okay, this is when I was in fifth grade, and I know we were still living in Montana when I was in fifth grade because I had to start a new school when I was in sixth grade and that was wherever the next place was and you can start to see it take shape and uh, so for me it helps to make lists and lists are different for everyone but tell me when um, I list off some of these things if this doesn't start your thought processes. Um, so write about your family vacations and outings. Write about your best and worst neighbors. One of mine was the lady that liked the dead people better than the live ones. One time she was growing a garden and I had a three-year-old son and one of her watermelon vines snaked through her fence and started growing a watermelon on our side of the yard. And I'm into gardening about as much as I'm into genealogy, so I took my son out and I said, hey, we've got a watermelon, we're growing a garden. And I gave him a little watering can and he would go out every day and he would water that watermelon. And he, that was his baby, he loved that watermelon and and he never missed watering that little watermelon and watched it grow and it was getting almost to the point where we were going to be able to harvest our watermelon. But my neighbor, being sort of the little red hen type, looked through that chain link fence and said, that, that's not Susan's watermelon, that's my watermelon. I planted the seeds and she sent her son over into the yard to harvest the watermelon while my teary-eyed three-year-old looked out the window and my watermelon is taking my watermelon. And uh, so, yes, stories. We all have them. Awards and accomplishments. The things I did for love. Sibling rivalries, parenting successes and challenges. Recently I put a little note on Facebook and said, hey, Mother's Day guilt season is here, so share with me your worst motherhood moments so that other women will feel less inadequate. Oh my goodness, <coughs> the stories, the stories. I am writing a thank you note to my son, who is quite artistic, to say, Scott, thank you that with all of your artistic endeavors, you never became Poop Casso. I didn't realize that there were so many children out there 
that use that medium, but now I know. <laughs> Near misses, failures, disappointments. Anybody have any of those? Um, broken bones, stitches, um, are little medical mishaps, the time you fell out of the tree and you didn't break a bone because you landed on your little sister who ended up in the emergency room. Presentations, talks, performances. My very first performance that I remember was that my parents had put me in the dance classes when I was three years old at the nearby um, neighborhood center and we didn't have a lot of means and that was a way they could get me free dance lessons but we were having a recital and they said that we were supposed to wear uh, blue leotards and, um, and white tights. And my parents were able to get me a leotard but they had to borrow a pair of white tights from somebody else. But they were two sizes too small. So I was up there tap dancing my little heart out in these two small tights that were <laughs> slowly making their way south. And the only thing I can say is that I'm grateful that there wasn't YouTube or video cameras back then because I'm glad that that memory only lives in here and isn't out there for all the world to see. Jobs, coworkers, bosses, doesn't that uh, bring to mind all kinds of stories? Family gatherings, family reunions. Um, one of the categories that I am using to interview my husband on is disasters, accidents, and storms that he's been involved in. This is my husband Tom back here in the corner. And uh, he's kind of a disaster junkie. And he told me the reason he likes to live on the Big Island of Hawaii is because it's the most disaster prone county in the country. You've got, you know, your tsunamis, earthquakes, lava flow, you know, so many things can go wrong. And I think, in contrast, I once stood in front of his big disaster map that shows all the country and all the various things, and I'm like, where? is the safest place in the country that I could go hide from all of these potential disasters. But then I realized that I could still slip on the soap in the shower. And uh, so that's one of the, the areas, though, that I am interviewing him to hear about his stories in that area, because that's something that he is interested in and has been involved with. Another list that I have come up with for myself is called Best Comebacks and Memorable Lines. And they're, they're not all mine. I'm also very willing to admit when I have been bested by someone else. And a couple of my best, most memorable lines come from um, my children. My son Scott, when he was about 15, I had decided for old time's sake that we would color some Easter eggs. And the Easter egg coloring was in these little pellets, or these little capsules, instead of the pellets that I was used to. And so we just dropped one in every jar of water and nothing happened. I thought they were self-dissolving. And it turns out you were supposed to open the pellet and pour the coloring in. But by the time we figured that out and tried to do it, they were wet. And so we ended up coloring our fingers more than the eggs. And so I pulled out the directions and ascertained that that was the case. And uh, I said, yeah, I guess we should have read the directions first, huh? And Scott said, yeah, here's what we missed. And I said, does it say that you're supposed to open out the capsules and pour the coloring in? And he says, no, it says right here that we're supposed to have adult supervision. <laughs> Another time with my youngest stepson, Christopher, um, 
I was driving him to football practice and he saw a cute girl on the side of the road and he says, you know, I've, I've heard that if you work really hard on your mission, that God will bless you with a beautiful wife. And uh, being as how my husband and I have a blended family and I am his second wife, I said, so your dad must have worked really hard on his mission to have had two such beautiful wives. And he says, well, I understand he worked really hard the first half and then he kind of slacked off. <laughs> So, you know, if I don't write these things down, they will not be there for posterity. You need to come up with interesting chapter titles. This is one of mine, Gentlemen, Start Your Engines. When I was in the third grade, and I was a very competitive child, and I was in a showdown with fellow ward member and down the street friend Craig Decker. There were only two of us still standing on the stage for the third grade spelling bee. I was in the middle of reading Huckleberry Finn at the time when the teacher gave me my word, engine. Only she didn't pronounce it real clearly and I could have sworn she said engine. So I spelled it. I N J U N and the crown went to Craig Decker and it wasn't so much that I lost but that I lost on a simple word like engine that I knew how to spell so if uh, you can come up with interesting fun chapter titles and headings it helps to divide the sections out by subject and also one of the things that you learn as a writer they tell you show don't tell and so if you can reconstruct obviously you're not going to get conversations word for word correct but it's more interesting to read a reconstructed conversation than to just read a narrative of what happened between two people. Include pictures and details about the way you lived your life. I have a picture of the old roller skates that we used to have that needed a key to uh, lock them around your tennis shoes and then they would inevitably come loose and, uh, and there was only one one kid that had the skate key around his neck and you'd be limping down the street trying to catch up with your brother so he could re-tighten your skates again and, and uh, some of those kinds of things that um, will be interesting to future generations. And uh, here are just a couple of headings that I came up with when um, the subject was college, roommate stories, Rex and the Gerber girl, writing the dorm newspaper, corresponding with Australian missionaries, work study in the history department, the dog food sample job, the time I was forced to go to work at Logan Laundry. After three months of working there, I told the owner that I was quitting and he said, but Susan, some of these ladies have been here 20 and 30 years, and I said, I know, that's why I'm getting out now. <laughs> the day that I became an official Aggie, which is a Utah State thing, I don't know if they have something like that here. You have to be kissed on the A on Old Main Hill at midnight, so I did it. <laughs> Do your research. You may have to do some detective work. Ask others to share their memories, but be prepared that they may have a different memory of things than you do. And make it clear that this is your version of events so that when your little brother doesn't like how you wrote about him, just say, well, that's how it looked to me, the big sister, and you know, you write your history, you can write about me however you'd like to write about. 
in a perfect world, if by chance your family or history is strong in not so great areas, and you don't feel that you had the benefit of great examples of courage or integrity or resilience, you can be the one to break the cycle and create a positive narrative and an example of resilience for future generations. Be authentic. And this is an excerpt from You Are Boring, But You Are Uniquely Boring by Lu Louise Plummer and Anne Cannon. Writing memoir is celebrating an essential life with its diverse experiences, good, bad, and ugly, and writing it with authenticity. Describe the life you lived, not the one you wish you'd lived. And if you take them down, bring them back up. If you've got less than perfect things to write about and your parents were neglectful or abusive or other bad things happened to you, write about that kind school teacher who was there for you with a listening ear or the helpful neighbor that you were able to go to and uh, find a friend. So to write about growing up in families is to write about our humanity. Tell the truth, but write it with compassion and humor. Balance out the grizzly with what was good in your life at the time, a friend, a pet, a kind neighbor or coach. If there is a redemption story in there, go ahead and tell it. Share your faith promoting experiences, but don't make your life sound like it was just one faith promoting experience after another because then it's like testimony meeting every day and nobody ever wants to share well sometimes they do share that they're having brothers and sisters I've been having so many trials lately you know but um, but but to um, share sometimes when the answers don't come one time when I was first dating my husband and he had recently lost his wife to cancer and it was the first Sunday that we had gone to church together and or the second I guess and it was testimony meeting and all these people got up and shared their cured from cancer stories and I could see out of the corner of my eye that this was taking its toll on him and I started silently praying, please would somebody get up and talk about something besides cancer. And then a woman got up and she started telling this feel-good story about how the traffic had stopped on the road in both directions to let a mother duck and her ducklings cross the road. And I thought, oh, that's so much better. And then she said, and then there was a car coming in the far lane that couldn't see why everybody was stopped. And it hit the mother duck, and the feathers flew into the air, and the baby ducks were scattering in the road. They didn't know which way to go. And, and then I was like, please, would somebody get up and talk about cancer again? But, uh, and at that point, my husband-to-be got up and walked out of the meeting and said, I don't think I can have my faith strengthened anymore today. <laughs> there, there is, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, at the bottom of it there is a little pink um, piece of paper that I found in an airport one time when I was on my way back from Honolulu with my husband after his second back surgery and lots of struggles ahead and it had fallen off of somebody's carry-on bag and it just said carry on carry on carry on so I picked it up and said okay that's I call those postcards from God and uh, so keep your eye out maybe he'll send you a postcard and make sure that those small spiritual experiences get into your story as well as the big ones. Feel free to break the rules. You are not <coughs> writing this for the masses. You can write it any way you want to. I have had great fun writing my 
history because I say, okay, you know what? I'm going to put an interesting footnote about this person down here, and I do my little back to the future um, excerpts because I think, okay, so if I write about the kid who repeatedly knocked my crayons on the floor in the fourth grade and how just when I was ready to go ask my teacher, my male teacher sitting in the back of the room to help me with this big bully who had reached a new record on how many times he had knocked my crayons over, I turned around and saw that Mr. Johns was laughing hysterically at the whole scene, wondering if I was ever going to run out of patience and whack this kid with the nearest Encyclopedia Britannica. And then, years later, as a teenager, I'm up in Idaho, and the family we were visiting had some friends come over, and this cute teenage boy introduced himself to me. He told me his name was Gene. When he found out I was from Salt Lake, he said, hey, I used to live in Salt Lake. Oh, what area? Oh, what school? Oh, I went to that school. Oh, we moved when I was in the sixth grade. What is your last name? Reynolds. You're that fat kid who used to knock my crayons on the floor. So that was the end of what might have been a beautiful relationship. But right there, I put a little flash forward so that 300 pages later, I don't say, oh, and I ran into this kid that, and they're like, wait, was that the kid who won the spelling bee? No, he's the one who knocked her crayons on the floor. And they don't have to go flipping back because I immediately tell you, and then 20 years later, or 10 in this case, I ran into him. I said, no, I'm not going out with you because you knocked my crayons on the floor because that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I made up that writing technique and I have my special back from the future font and uh, so have fun with it. Start small. You don't have to write about your whole life at once. Uh, my very first book was entitled The Adventures of Wanda One Date. Wanda One Date was a nickname that a friend of mine gave me in high school because usually for me or the guy, one date was enough and we knew whether we liked each other. And so I wrote about the adventures of Wanda One Date. Mind the family love stories. If your grandparents are alive, your great grandparents, your parents, <coughs> ask them about their love stories and I have done these covers that I'm going to show you um, on something called Create Space, and it's great. You just go on the stock photo places, and if you're seriously going to use a picture, then you pay for it. If you're just experimenting, then you copy and paste until you find the right picture that you want, and, uh, and you can dummy up a cover of a book, and when you do that, it makes you feel like you're writing a real book. So, um, and if you haven't got a wonderful love story to tell yet, tell about some of your near dating experiences. Because, you know, one of the things that bugs me about romance novels is that, you know, maybe there'll be one heartbreak and then immediately the next guy that she meets will be the one. And it's like, no, come on, show a few more near misses, or we almost got there, and then he went back to his old girlfriend, and the way it happens in real life. But they don't want romance novels to be like War and Peace, to be 2,000 pages long. And so they skip a lot of that. So, so I am working on a collection of our family love stories. And I did this one for Doctor and, and uh, Alred and his wife. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you the code so you can pull up the cover yet later and you can uh, just add in the details. I started, you don't have to stay with their eyes met over a bean burrito, but that was, you know, the best I could come up with on short notice. 
this this is what a writer friend of mine told me was going to be the subject of his memoirs about parenthood. Somebody pooped in the ball pit. And I figure that just kind of sums up parenthood. Um, someday you'll know what I'm talking about. And this is just another one that I dummied up. The Nine Lives of Cat Lewis, Hollywood Stunt Woman. And then you read the back and it says, okay, so I wasn't really a Hollywood stunt woman, I was a klutz. But if you can get a theme going, if you can find something that kind of defines how you see yourself or would like to see yourself, then it, it gets the momentum started. Um, it helps you to visualize the finished product. Seeing the end from the beginning is one of the seven habits of people more successful than you. And a title gives you direction, and you can easily change it if you get a different inspiration. Come up with a theme. This uh, next one that I'm going to show you is the cover that I've done for the book that I'm writing about my husband. And so he always tells me that he was born under a wandering star. So I call that the life and times of a rambling man. And uh, all the different places that he's lived. And Hawaii is one of the places that he's put down more roots than most places. And what makes your story unique? At the bottom here, and you can't probably read this very well, but there is a sample ad. We're not sure if it was the exact one, although the dates were right, but Tom said that the phone number was wrong. It says, young couple wish to adopt a baby, will pay expenses, right to blah, blah, blah in Washington. That is how Tom came to be adopted by his by his parents. Share the moments of pure joy. This is Big Tommy meeting Little Tommy and realizing that while he may not know where he came from, but the family tree is branching out in the forward direction. Find one picture that sums up your life. And this is a, a book that I started called Why Don't the Airlines Ever Lose My Emotional Baggage? Being willing to share your struggles might be what helps someone else get through theirs. So this is the, the cover that I've made for the first 20 years of my life is the rough draft. And the second 20 is an open book the third is The Plot Thickens, which a friend of mine so kindly pointed out that I gave it that title because that's the time of life when more than the plot starts to thicken. <laughs> and I was so grateful to her for reminding me about that. And this one is called Working to Deadline. And uh, that was what I came up with as the title at the, at the beginning, and then I realized that this is going to be too big to put all in one. So I said, okay, working to deadline to remind myself that I don't really know how much time I have to work on this. In the final analysis, we are all working to deadline. Your writing may also prompt an interest in family history work. Get started, and the momentum will build. None of us know if our life story has another 892 pages or another three paragraphs. So I hope that I have inspired some of you to sit down and start writing about yourself. And I gave you this little life sketch that you can fill out and double duty, you know, if you walk in front of a bus can also, you know, you've already pre-written your obituary. So this is a good thing. Um, certainly something to think about. I mean, do you want to leave that up to the amateurs? You know. So anyway, I've got a few minutes for some questions. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask me? Yes. 
So you say writing about the good and the bad, but say if there is something that you don't necessarily want other people to know, do you include that in your, in your writing? Well, that is up to you. If if there's something that you did and you are so ever so very ashamed of it and you don't want to share it, then I would say leave it out. If it's something that um, you don't want to write about because it might be hurtful to someone else, um, there's always the possibility of, of changing some of the details so that it isn't obvious to everybody who your best friend that betrayed you and ran off with your best girlfriend was. But on the other hand, mom is still mom, dad is still dad, and family members, people that were there, often will guess who players are. On the other hand, I have found with my novels that when I put people in in a negative way, they never see themselves, they never recognize themselves. Yes, Dr. Arnold. I was going to point out that uh, Benjamin Franklin, when he wrote his autobiography, he said, if I had to live my life over, I probably wouldn't change very much. But he says, I have the second best thing, which is writing my life, and I have the privilege of editing. Right, editing. And so you are the editor, and, and you can decide. I mean, as I write about some of the things that happened to me in, in elementary school and I think, okay, why am I, why am I writing about the, my, my struggles and my failures and where are my, where are my success stories? Um, but, and of course, those things are very benign. I am not terribly ashamed for anyone to find out that I can't spell engine, but, uh, but yes, you're the editor. And, uh, and you can also, at the beginning, say, you know, my intention in writing about this is not to hurt anyone or to whatever, you know, I'm writing this as, as fairly and honestly as I can. Um, say whatever you'd like to say to clarify why you did or did not include something. Yes? Um, what's your opinion on, like, uh, instantly publishing things like blogging or, or just using social media for, to write about your life? <laughs> um, if I dare to be a small bit political for a moment, I think that we all would do well to consider our tweets before we send them out over the airwaves. I won't name any names, but I think that sometimes um, people are too quick, myself included. I have, uh, I hurt the feelings of one of my childhood friends by posting something funny that had happened at girl camp, that girls camp, that apparently she did not find nearly as amusing as I did. And it took me months of apologies to get back in her good graces. And her daughter wrote me a very scathing note, and how dare you hurt my mother this way. And, and, um, and I've learned to um, measure twice and saw once. So, and you know, we've got that instant gratification thing going on. And, and yet, also people seem surprised when they put their opinions out there on the airway then they're like, well, people were so rude about what they said about my tweet or my Facebook post or whatever. And it's like, well, when you put yourself out there, you have to expect that people are going to react and that not everyone is going to agree. But I have a many uplifting blogs that I've read that, that have um, given me great ideas for parenting or grandparenting or um, any of a number of things, so I just think that you need to carefully review things before you click that button and send it out into the world. And if you Google Susan Lockhart and blog, you'll find several of them that <laughs> Susan's the author of varying lengths. Yes, that my husband reminded me. And you haven't posted on this one in this long, and what happened to this one in, and my... Uh, ADD that runs in the family, and, and I, I 
a few couple of years ago, um, Tom took me on a trip to Israel, which, you know, so much unrest in that part of the world that I'm always a little bit nervous about traveling there. And so I took all of my partially finished novels and writings and I put them all together in one big document and I called it The Unfinished Works of Susan Law Corpany and uh, figured if something happened to me then my family could publish that. Sometimes dying can be a good career move, so you never know. <laughs> so anyway, it looks like our time is up, and I would like to thank you for having me here today, and uh, hope that some of you will be inspired to get started on some of the writings, and the good news for you is you're young enough, you don't have 60 years that you have to write about. You can probably still remember what happened, and uh, you can get done and then keep up from there. So thank you. <laughs>